Hey folks, welcome. MLR kickoff here and we are in the penultimate round before the playoffs. If we come to an end, we know who will be playing finals footy this year. All six teams have been decided on. Now it's just a matter of seeding and some big games coming up this weekend will dictate that as well. Dan Powell with you alongside, as always, the Professor Pete Steinberg. And Pete, we have our six teams. We know who's in the playoffs. A little bit around seedings, in particular on the Western Conference. We know New England holds a number one seed, but still the West is wide open. Who can grab that number one seed out West? Yeah, I mean, I think the games this past weekend were great because so many of them had playoff implications, which I think is great for the league. But now we're, you know, we have a bunch of games that are sort of like where players are playing for next year, maybe even coaches are playing for their jobs for next year, and a few games that are really going to um, decide eliminator rounds, right? Like you said in the West, um, home games in the East for that eliminator round. So there's still some stuff to play for and some interest um, for us to follow on this closing weekend. Well, now I'm excited. Who's on the hot seat in the coaching world, uh, Professor? Who do you think oh, is coaching I mean, for I their think, job this weekend? I, I, well, I think there's a number of coaches that, for me, I think could look and probably say that they are disappointing seasons, right? So I think that you can look at all the teams that didn't quite make it, right? You could look at Toronto, right, that, that mm -hmm. didn't quite make it. You could look at Seattle that didn't quite make it. Um, San Diego, right? That was a team that had a bunch of um, uh, senior players that didn't quite make it. And one of the really interesting things about MLR is how quickly teams have pulled the trigger. I mean, teams have pulled the trigger on winning coaches that have been to playoffs, let alone on, on teams that didn't make it. So um, owners have certainly shown, haven't shown a lot of patience so far in the history of MLR. So it wouldn't surprise me if there are some team, there's some play, players here that are playing for contracts, but coaches too. Yeah, it's so Toronto, San Diego, both first-year coaches, <laughs> which obviously, as we've seen, doesn't mean much. San Diego um, too. That's what I said. Toronto, San yeah. Diego, both oh. first-year coaches. Two ears, one mouth. So double the listening. I thought, well, yeah, I was no. thinking Seattle because Seattle's sort of a first-year well, coach. Clark, he's technically into his third year. Right. I mean, if you, you kind of rule out the COVID and all the all the stuff around that, but – that would, that would, you know, they, they obviously went close and, and a couple of results, but knowing the history up in Seattle, that would probably be one that I would keep an eye on. Seattle could be making a change there. Um, what about in the East Coast? Who missed out in the East Coast? NOLA, they just extended their coach, so probably nothing going on there. Uh, Toronto, like I said, Pete Smith first year. I, 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 Toronto I, I, seems Toronto's very, very continuity focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very continuity focused. I agree. Focused. Oh, Glory have already made a change, so probably nothing there as well. Well, I think, um, I mean, it'll be, there, there are interim coaches, right? So the question is, does Nate Osborne continue at Old Glory? He came in as an interim, yeah. seems to have made, had, had an impact, right? Turned a team round that wasn't being competitive and made them competitive, won some games. And I think that's going to be an interesting, um, you know, question for the ownership about whether they continue with Nate or whether they look elsewhere. Yeah. Um, what about Dallas? Never really had a head coach, so yeah, that's one, right. Like. That's right. Yeah. So Dallas needs a needs a head coach. Where would you go? Let's let's say let's leave Toronto out, and let's leave San Diego out. Head coach Steinberg now, Professor. Oh, well, put the lab coat away. Where would you go? I mean, I wouldn't mind going to San Diego. I mean, just because that's the place to I live, just right? said leave them out. I know, I know. Coach. I said, okay, first year coach. So, so what are the choices I have? Dallas. Seattle, Dallas, Old Glory. We'll throw New Orleans in there for the fun of it. Uh, Utah. And am I forgetting someone? No, that'll do. I don't well, want I to think, get anyone so, else So I trouble. think it's really interesting, right? Because I think it depends. Like what, what, what you like about Old Glory is they've actually got a really like good back office system there. Like they've got a really um, pay, um, engaged community, right? They have, they have a lot of sponsors. There's a lot of opportunity. And they're, it's a like Washington, D.C. is a destination. I think people, um, you can't mm. underestimate, like they got the beast there. Um, I'm not sure that they, you know, it's sort of like, yeah, LA and New York are probably the two biggest, San Diego and DC. 
DC is a real cosmopolitan place, really interesting. So DC is a really interesting spot. I love what NOLA does and what Utah do in terms of player development. Like I'm, I'm an old coach, right? So if I yeah. came in, I'd be like, all right, I want to build something. So a young coach that could work under me, I think NOLA and Utah would, would probably do that both. I think Seattle might have the best talent. I think NOLA has really, really good talent too. I think NOLA probably underperformed relative to their talent, but they had a late changing coach. I think that's really difficult to judge a coach that way. But I think in pure talent, some of the best players in the league are in Seattle. And if I was Seattle and I went there as a coach, the first thing I would do is I'd be like, I'd rename ourselves and I'd call myself like the Pacific Northwest Seawolves and I'd go up to BC and I'd go and get a bunch of like really top players that are up there that haven't moved yeah. to MLR teams. And I'd be like, hey, why don't you come down and play some MLR? There's there's still a talent pool up there. And there's definitely a hotbed of rugby that Seattle could own before a Vancouver team joins MLR. And a Vancouver team will join MLR. I don't think, I don't see it in the next few years if they haven't done it now. And so there is a chance for Seattle to own that. So I like, you, you know me, Dan, I think big picture strategy, right? You could really create an unstoppable um, program in Seattle if you use that Pacific Northwest? I would be very hesitant knowing the Seattle fan base, how they would embrace someone called the Pacific Northwest. I know, I agree. I was kind of joking about that, but but still you should go up. You should go up into British Columbia and you should get the fans. And, you know, I know it's been hard with COVID, but you should get the fans and you should get, um, some players to come down. Uh, Utah's the same way in terms of the playing base, right? They've got a really strong like um, mm. competition. It's very attractive for Pacific Islanders to come. I mean, there's strengths in each of these MLR teams actually have some strengths that you could really leverage. So um, I think all all of it would be would be good. I, I would, you know, because this isn't going to happen, Dan. What I would do is I would interview teams and then work out who has the best support structure for the coach. Um, and then go from there. I go to Dallas. Cannot get any worse. The only way is up in <laughs> Dallas. So that's, that's my true. Pick. That's that true. is my pick. Go and, is it, and, 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 you know, you've got a pretty good fly half if you believe the rumors in Danny Cipriani. So that's definitely someone to play you, around. You, you, yeah, you do. But you've, you've got an old but very talented uh, and experienced fly <laughs> half. All right, mate, let's let's keep moving along the show. We do have a great show. And again, I'm really looking forward to actually doing the preview for the games this weekend, j- jumping into the ones that do have significance to the playoffs. But we've got a chance to, to catch up with one of the stars of the league who will be making not only his first trip to the playoffs, but the team, the franchise's first trip to the playoffs. And they started in 2018. I'm talking about the Houston Sabercats who locked things up on the weekend against Seattle. And we had a chance to sit down early today, Pete, and catch up with their back row, Malon Al Jabouri. Joining us now is Sabercats back row, Malon Al Jabouri. And Malon, thanks for joining the show, mate. What a season. The Sabercats, they've figured it out. It only took five years, but they've figured it out. How are you holding up, mate? Must be exciting times down in Houston. No, definitely. Thanks for one. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, it's the atmosphere and it's the culture around the boys. Obviously, the new team new coaching staff, and everyone's really excited that obviously the bigger goal and going to the final, but we just appreciate and just all the efforts we put into reaching the playoffs so far. Let's just talk a little bit about like that moment, right? Uh, against Seattle, a win inside a loss, you lose the game, but yeah. effectively Povey kicks a penalty that locks up a playoff spot. Did you guys, were you crunching the numbers out there towards the back end of the game and what it was going to take? Yeah, I think, I mean, going to the game, the boys knew that we only really needed uh, two points. But obviously, in any game, you want you want the five bonus point win. So it was, it was, it was kind of weird. I never experienced anything like it because obviously we lost. Um, but at the same time, we won. Um, I mean, I, I personally was a bit upset because <laughs> we didn't win the game. But then looking in the future, obviously, is worth it because we we came back second half and got the uh, the two points that we needed to secure the playoffs. So that was, that was exciting in itself. Now talk about us, you know, new coaching staff, South Africans, right? All South Africans. Talk yeah. a little bit about what was different maybe about preseason than some preseasons you've had before. Um, I, I think this was a bit – it's different because no one knew each other at all. Even, even for the most part, the South Africans, a lot of boys didn't know – I mean, they knew of each other, but they didn't really know each other. Um, then obviously there's – I think there's two boys from last season that's still on the team. 
So most of the time, any other team I've been a part of, people kind of knew each other personally. Then here, it was a bit different. I mean, I knew the Sevens, sevens guys uh, from my time in San Diego. But, yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty interesting preseason and leading up to the season because everyone everyone would know how to communicate with each other. And we had to figure it out from, the, from scratch, basically. Now, you guys started as a team that was really physical, that ground out results. It looked like that that was how you actually practiced. Was it a very physical like is it is is it very physical practice? Do you guys hit each other a lot? Because it seems like you hit, um, you you enjoy hitting each other, or at least hitting the opposition in the games. It's it's definitely a mixture. I know I know for the forwards we really like to hit each other, obviously, in the lineouts and the scrums. So in the in the, in the forwards you practice, we get a bit physical, which I think is pretty much normal. Then in team sessions, obviously we we try to save it for the weekend, but there's there's times in training where we have to get into each other a bit, which is I think it's pretty normal. I like it. So I think most of the boys enjoy it. And I think that's the biggest thing why we come out uh, Saturdays for the, the physical matches, because we, it's all a mindset to me. We can, you can train it, but you got to want to do it. And that's what really the coaches uh, really hard on is about the mindset going into the game and actually doing it. I'm going to go full Tarantino here. You know, I'm going to go like the middle end of the story <laughs> and I'm going to go back around and then we're going to piece all good. together at the end. Tell us about the the approach from Houston to get you down there. You're playing over in the UK uh, with Ealing. You've obviously got a background with the Sevens program. You mentioned that a couple of your teammates, Maka and Danny, I know are down there as well. How did you land yourself at the Sabercats? Um, I think I think it's a blend of things. Obviously, uh, me going to London and obviously in the middle of the pandemic, it was, it was a bit hard on me just being away from my family. Um, and... And uh, it, I, honestly, I think the Ealing thing went the way I would hope for. And I think that, I mean, I, I didn't, I definitely enjoyed my time there. I was saying it work out long term. Um, the Houston, obviously, being in Texas, being close to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is pretty close. I think it's like an hour and a half flight. Um, that really played a big role. Then I know Heineke, uh, Heineke Meyer, uh, our coach, uh, director, um, he has obviously, he has an experience most coaches don't really have. And that kind of drove me towards Houston. And obviously having Danny, Matai, Maka, uh, Christian Dyer, Nick Boyer from the Sevens, the familiar faces that I needed because obviously moving to London was a big move for me. And um, being being around faces I knew. And obviously it's an, also a new experience. I mean, I never lived uh, – I forgot how far D- uh, Houston is in Texas. It's, it's down there. Um, I've been in Dallas a few times, but Houston is very deep down in Texas. It day it doesn't get much further than Galveston, and then you run out of yeah. run out of real estate. Right. Uh, you're in, into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, now let's go right back to the beginning. You mentioned Tulsa, Oklahoma. You grew up in to- Tulsa, Oklahoma. Bit of a football star. Um, what was the turning point? What, you can own it. Don't worry. No one's going to fact check. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry about that. Uh, what was what was the crossroad for you uh, to go rugby, Lindenwood? you know, instead of going down the football path? Yeah, actually, I committed to go to any, like, a JUCO uh, college football team. And I think about well, my brother, Michael Algebra, the oldest brother of the family. Um, he's, he's playing rugby at University of Oklahoma. Um, and he, um, he really just tried to sh- like show me, like, rugby, just like a different outlet than obviously growing up watching football. It's very coach-oriented, and rugby is, like, almost, like, player-led in a way. And I kind of enjoyed that. Um, so I started playing junior, senior year high school, I think about 16. Um, I got on with it. Then I think I still wanted to play football because obviously I played football my whole life. I was just, I was just loving football. Um, then I committed to, like I said, I committed to a JUCO, um, I think in northern Oklahoma. Then about two weeks before um, I was supposed to re- uh, start was spring, spring season, yeah, spring uh, practice, I just had some feeling in my body. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. It was, it was a bit odd. It happened so fast. So two weeks before, I was like, I want to go Lindenwood and I want to play rugby. Um, then that kind of that jump-started everything with the rugby. So let's talk about, you know, there's um, the World Cup's coming in 2031. There's a, a now professional league that didn't exist when you made that choice, yeah. right? Yeah. So what's, like, I, I guess there's two questions. So let's start with this one. Um, how how can rugby and Major League Rugby attract more athletes like yourself that were very good football players and could follow that pathway? What 
what does rugby have to do to get more of um, Milan Algebori's out in, in on the pitch? I think I think the big well for me personally the big thing is how the culture of rugby is different from American football. It's massively different. Um, I, 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 this is my personal opinion. I think football is a bit is a bit it's intense. It's like it, rugby. There's nothing like the rugby culture. I think if we can show that to to high schools and like it's a like it's a brotherhood, it's a family. It's not it's not really a job. Um, also, when you get to the professional level, it, it's, your, it's, it's your job, obviously, but it doesn't feel that way at times. It's more like a family. I think if we can show that and show like there's the promote like like now now we have a World Cup now now we can see like you can play on an international stage in front of your family and on home soil. I think that's a big deciding factor. Because um, when I first started, I didn't know I didn't know the World Cup. I didn't know anything like that when I first started playing. And obviously, when I noted when I knew that, I was like, oh, and this is this is what I want to do for the next five, six, seven years to to get that goal. Well, you know, you mentioned something about um, that I thought was really interesting about the rugby culture, which is very different, right? Which is this idea of football is coach centric; the coach controls yeah. everything, and rugby is player centric. I mean, I think people are, are amazed that the head coach sits up in the stands. Right, exactly. while, yeah, while, yeah. while the game's going on. So, you know, that's obviously something that has attracted you. So let's talk about you as a player, like taking that control of what you want to do on the pitch. Like how have you grown as someone who took up the sport, you know, relatively young for America, but when you went to Ealing, you were playing with guys that played a decade longer than you, right? That stopped yeah, exactly. playing at five yeah. and six. So, so how have you developed your game with that freedom that rugby gives you to – like do whatever you want. I think uh, for me, it helped me with my communication is because if you don't, honestly, if you don't talk in rugby or you don't talk in any type of rugby environment, whether that's sevens or fifteens, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to, you're not going to succeed. So it kind of make you in a way, make you grow up a bit. Um, I think that's the biggest thing I took from it. Like going from sevens, I had to talk, obviously when I first, I, I was 18, 19 going to sevens and I see all Danny, I see Perry, I see Carlin. And I, at first, I was I didn't say much when I was when I first arrived. Then it made me have to speak a lot more than that. And that not only did I help you with the rugby stuff on the field, but off the field, it helps a lot with it growing as a as a man. Now, now I love that because rugby's I think the best developmental tool yeah. for individual development. Right, it just helps you become a better person. I think communication is key. I I, I want to like you know, follow that on in that idea of growth into the Sabercats this year. You guys started off, you you know, you were a little bit up and down, but your attack in the last month has really exploded. You know, you scored 34 points, 31 points, 59 points, and even in the loss, it's 36 points. Yeah. And I think that was a concern that I had for the Sabercats early on was, were you able to produce enough points? What's been the key to that? Like, like why have you suddenly started scoring? I think, like, I think it starts from the beginning. I think we, everyone's new. I think we're clicking at the right time. Obviously, you don't want to. I think you don't want to pick too soon. And I think I think the, the cohesion throughout the season that obviously we our 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 DNA of the team is physicality, defense. But then with always the attack, you you the way the way we see it is the defense is our attack. So if you put pressure on them, then eventually a mistake is going to happen, and that's when you get to attack opportunities. I think we just we didn't really try to chase our attack. I think we let it came naturally. Uh, let it come naturally. Um, I think that we are finally gelling as a team because, like I said, we we haven't been together, only been together about five months now. Some of us even uh, less. I think that we didn't really force anything. I think that's why everything's coming together. We let it like, naturally flow. Yeah, talking about gelling and naturally flowing, what the heck's going on with Harry's hair at the moment? Have you had a word to him? <laughs> no, nah, I'll let him do his thing. He's his, own, he's his own person. That's what I like about him. He's just his own person. Influences, man. Influences. Hey, let, let's talk. You mentioned your older brother, Michael, a couple of times. Let's talk about your younger brother. Played on the weekend in the CRCs yeah. for Lindenwood. Couldn't live up to your, you know, lofty standards of, of winning a national championship. But what do you think of his performance? I think, I think Tyron, we're, we're definitely different players. He, I think he's, I think he works harder than me, to be honest. I think he's, he loves, I'm a really big fitness guy. Even though I played sevens, I just, I struggle with my fitness every year. I think I have to put, I have to really focus on that. I think it comes naturally towards him. I think that's what we always talk about when we come together as a family. Like he naturally just, he wants to work very, very, very hard in the fitness game. And I think that's what separates him from a lot of players, especially us brothers. Uh, I think he went well. I think he just need, college rugby obviously 
it's not full time. It's it's not full time professional environment. So I think when he when he reaches that, his his own skills and his him f- figuring out who he what kind of player he wants to be will come naturally. And I always just tell him don't force anything and just let it let it, it all happen eventually. Yeah, it's good advice there. Big brother taking care of the, the younger brother. I like it. Hey, uh, let, let's talk playoffs. You, you booked your ticket. Sometimes that is the achievement in itself for the season. How does Houston now emotionally recharge to not just get into the playoffs, but, you know, make a run into the playoffs as well? I think we just have to take it game by game. Like obviously, we mo- most people know that this, this upcoming game, we either – we're, there's, big, there's a good chance we might play Austin again the following week, so I think we we don't need to look too past like past that too much and just realize the game in hand this this coming weekend is going to set a tone for the next game, whether that's we play Austin or we play LA. I think we need to focus on the game in hand and that's and that's playing Austin at home. And like I said, we we never been in the playoffs, so just uh, we we get a home game um, to get the momentum until next week because there's a higher chance we play Austin again. What's your thought process going in? Do you go out and smash them? You know, you put some deep cuts into their psyche, or, I th- or I think do you we, keep something close? I think we. I don't think we change it. I think we are like I said. Our DNA is be physical, and we want to show that we're a physical team. And obviously, uh, early in the year, they gave us a good a good match, and they they came and they came. They, I think they they beat us pretty bad. I think it was our uh, forty something to six or oh, not six five or ten. I forgot what it was. Um, so obviously we wouldn't have redeemed ourselves from that match. Um, I think I just don't think we look look past the, the team uh, this weekend, and regardless who got there and played, I think we put our best foot forward. All right, last one for you. Preseason, you're on a road race with the Sabre Cats. You're going for a five mile run. You pass the person in second. What place are you now? <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's going on? I'm passing. Say it yeah. again. Say it again. You're in a running race with the Sabre Cats. It's off season. You're running, you're flying. You've discovered this new fitness craze. You pass the person in second place. What place are you now? I'm in first place. Well, no, hang on. What happened to the person in first place? Well, I, I passed the person that's in, that, that was second. Yeah. So what happened to the person who was in first? You didn't pass them. Yeah, but who said we weren't we were next to each other? I could be tied for first. Yeah, to be no, fair, person, I think I think the question the is person who's in first is still in first. No, You're no, no, because oh, I think I think no, I'm I'm Dan. I think this is ambiguous. This is right? let the people decide. In second, this is this is like yeah, no, no, no. Milan, Milan's right. Like it kind of depends. You said you pass the person in second, but if I if I've already yes. passed them, they're in second. Is that you've passed the yeah, person who is in second. You you didn't say you're in second. So you're well, okay. So that's different. I would phrase that differently. No, if you've passed the person who is in second, in second now they're place. second. You're first. <laughs> yeah. No. Now no, you're in second place. Your, your question because is: they were already in second. Person that's in second. Someone else was in first. Then first now. I, I, this is so. So this is Dan's very weird way of saying: Who's the fastest runner on the Saber Cats? I'm taking. I'm taking it very little. I'm a very little person. You said I passed the second. <laughs> Right. I mean, I mean, I'm in first place. <laughs> I'm okay the with people, that. The people will Dan, decide. Dan, uh, uh, Dan, Dan, I will ask the question. Malone, who's the fastest guy in the Saber Cats? That was Dan's way of asking that. The fastest no. guy, I say, I say, it's a tie between Billy Brits and Matai Luita. Really? Yeah. Really? Billy Brits. Really fast. He will. Wow. I don't think he's not fast. He's very fast. <laughs> Wow. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have selected the 33-year-old guy. He, I don't, I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he does it. Just, uh, you ask him yourself. He's fast. Long cool. strides. Long strides. All right, Malon. Appreciate you jumping on, my man. Good luck, obviously, this weekend into the playoffs. Uh, it's going to be exciting. It's great to see uh, the yellow and black represented in finals footy this year. All the best to you. Are you headed back to Houston next year? You got another year on the contract, right? Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's the plan. That's the plan. We all oh, free agent. <laughs> no, we're working some things out, but that's I definitely want to be in Houston, and then we're, we're just going to figure it out after we get this playoff run out the way. I love it. All the uh, row game that JT's been using to get his hair from the stress of losing. Now he's going to have to have it for the stress of keeping you on the roster. I'm coming uh, for you. Yeah, I'll get. I'll get. Appreciate having me. Thanks, mate. Good luck this weekend against Austin, Thank and you, then mate. most likely again the week after against Austin. Thank you.
There is Malin Al Jabouri from the Houston Sabercats. There we go, Pete. It's a good, uh, good rugby family that Michael and Tyron as well. Yeah. I got to do some of the CRCs on the weekend with uh, Tyron playing for Lindenwood. Uh, physically very different to his brothers, but you can see like that rugby is just ingrained in that family. And, you, and like you said, man, like we've got to have more of that. Like brothers, all it takes is a brother, and all of a sudden, or yeah. a sister plays, and boom, takes off. So. Good stuff. Yeah, and what I what I love about that story is not that he went off and played at the JUCO and like a Division One school. He at sixteen took up rugby and then decided to stick with rugby, and that's what we need. We need some of these guys that, you know, I'm sure Malone when he was growing up thought about playing at the NFL level, but when he was coming out of high school, like it's hard to go that JUCO route, right? And so he made a choice, and we want more players at the ages of like fifteen and sixteen to make those choices. All right, time for Rugby 101. I'm going to put you on the spot here. I'm going to pick it tonight. I know you've had zero preparation for this, but you are a rugby encyclopedia. And the coaching thing kind of got me intrigued here. If you were interviewing for a head coaching role, actually, let's go the other end. You're being approached. So they want you. There's no interview process. What are the three things you're asking for from a franchise before you even consider looking at them? Oh, Really, really good. So yeah. I think one is, um, what's the pipeline of domestic talent, right? So what's their strategy? I'm going to screw all these down. <laughs> what's their strategy for, for developing domestic talent? Because that's the pool yeah. that, that you've got to build around. And then I would ask, what's their network internationally, right? So, so how well connected are they internationally? Because the reality is that you can't win with just domestic talent right now. And in certain positions, you need to go and find someone that is um, that that in that can really have an impact, right? What you don't want to do is carry international players that aren't as good as or, or as equal to what you could find domestically. And that really, yeah. like that network, becomes really important because it's not just oh who's a good player, but it's like culturally are they a good fit? Yeah. And you have to have the yeah. network to be able to have that conversation, right? And so those are. Those are the two things. And then the third thing I would say is what's their high performance system? Because one of the things, Dan, we've talked about in MLR, right? Or what's their, what's their investment going to be in their high performance systems? Because in, um, you know, we've said in MLR, the team that has the least injuries generally wins and the least injuries coming comes from investing in performance analytics, right? Um, In the investment in um, the medical staff, right? The investment in the preparation and injury prevention, all of those sorts of things I think are really, really critical. And I wouldn't go anywhere that doesn't have a full-time analyst, that doesn't have um, like a a performance coach that has real rugby Mm -hmm. knowledge and understands how to integrate like the best rugby performance coaches, which is what you know, they used to be called strength and conditioning, but now they're called performance coaches. Yeah, it's evolved. Right? Yep. It's evolved, right? And part of that is that, you know, the best coaches are integrated in the coaching stuff. Like you run your practices in a way that allows the coach, the, the performance coach not to have to do conditioning, right? So you work with the performance coach and say, hey, if and it, they'll say, look, I've looked at your practice plan. And if you run this, I have to run them afterwards because they're not going to get enough load. But if you extend this a little bit or you change this workout a little bit or this activity, then they'll get the load that they need and then I won't have to run them afterwards. And so that way of integrating performance into your coaching program and and your practice plan becomes really critical when you're talking about an 18-week season and you're talking about trying to rest players. So you need a whole bunch of stuff where you can have predictive analytics where you know players are going to break down so you can rest them during the week. You have a whole side on the on the um mental sky the mental skill side where you can track their engagement and their their mental energy so you can give them days off and it has to be completely individualized so those are the three things like their plan for domestic talent whether it's through their academy or relationships with universities um their network internationally not only to find good players that good players that can fit so you can really find out about players and then the third thing is this concept of having this high performance system that can keep your best players on the field the most no cash, no talk of cash at all in the top three. I love it. What are you going to pay me? No, that's good. So that's good oh, oh, I, I, I would say the that. other thing is the other thing I would say is that um, I need to still do my coaching because they couldn't pay like my executive coaching and my consulting on the side in the off season because they probably couldn't afford me if they didn't do that. Like MLR coaching isn't isn't enough there. Sorry, love it. Just love sorry it. for you. 
I like it. Little little rich for my taste, so I'm going to take a pass. Okay. But, uh, appreciate, appreciate you coming in, putting that together for me. You're All welcome. right, let's talk. Let, let's talk. You know what? If we, Aaron Castro has delivered for me here. I begged for Friday night footy <coughs> all year, and he's given me three games. That's crazy. Three games of Friday night footy to finish the season. He sat down and he said, no, George, you listen to me. We're doing three games on Friday night, and I won't have it any other way. And he dropped the hammer, and we had three games. Let's kick it off. Nola Gold at Atlanta. Scenario coming into this one. Atlanta can get a home semifinal in week one with a five-point win and something else going their way here. Have to get through Nola. Good rivalry game. This one in Atlanta, though. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is really interesting, right? Because I think that, uh, first of all, this is a rivalry. Right, this is like yeah, this is this one. is one of the rivalries. It's a big, big rivalry. So I don't think I don't think this is a game that the Nola Gold take their foot off. Um, I think this is a game that they look to finish strong. Uh, um, but it's at ATL, and ATL. I'm just looking right now. ATL have a significant point difference in stats, boy. I think that is the first differentiator if you finish on equal points, right? Uh, well, equal points and equal wins is point differential okay so yeah. most wins both on 10 wins and and so um yeah yeah keep going <laughs> so I for some stats boy that stats boy was saying that they both have 10 wins so if they both mm-hmm. win with a bonus point they'll both have 10 wins they'll both be on 57 points but atl have like 84 points difference plus so if atl win on friday with a bonus point they'll be hosting that that like the the um the outcome is in their hands if they win with a bonus point they'll be hosting that eliminated round so that's boy, no, how the cool thing. new york is defense optional so don't really get they that are point playing at the exact same time I know. kicking off at the exact same time in new england new york new england another rivalry game now, here's the challenging one with this. Like, obviously, we know what New York has to pay for. They can get a home semifinal if, if Atlanta doesn't get maximum points or something happens. New England cannot do anything else. They can only hurt themselves here. I wouldn't be shocked if you see the uh, the independence play on Friday night. Like, the- uh, <laughs> You know what? I think it's interesting, right? Because they, they, um, they actually have a week off. Right? Do you want to go two weeks without playing your best side? Oh, you, what listen, I might if do, you've got your high performance manager, then he can probably run them hard enough to get no, through that. No, no, no. Can I think you two ima- weeks. Can you imagine Booby Milesing this? Like, and Boating Walker goes out there, rolls the ankle. It's kind of in suspect at the back half of the year, and you lose him for the playoffs. And what's the well, point think, of having this amazing think, year if you don't win? I mean, Tom Kinley was you, a soccer player. So rest- I think they can run a lot. <laughs> I think that the uh, um, I, uh, what I would say if I'm a coach here I would go to the performance coach and I'd be like any doubts anyone that isn't feeling great we're going to rest them right but that might be five players and then the other option you have here is you could be like you know what we're going to like you could actually say we're going to play our best side for 30 minutes right and then we're going to sub them out right so I would rest the players and then I would use this as a run for those players to get that in. Cause you also like, I, I think not playing for three weeks, right. Could have an impact. I wouldn't want to do that. I would want to yeah. I, like, I, I like I, I would, if, if they had a game next week, then I would be all over it. I'd be like the independence would play. But, no, I don't know. Maybe you schedule a game on that first week. Yeah, but that's the worst. Like, then you get injured. So, so I think Bowden no, probably no, doesn't no. play if his ankle's been bugging him. He doesn't play. I think there are other players that, that, that may not play. Maybe Conrad, he doesn't play. Like, I think anyone who's carrying something doesn't play. So I think that's true. But I think that, like, you know, you can't go out with the independence. I don't think, like, no, like you, you can't do that. Three Jacks fans will see some names on the roster they haven't seen all year long. <laughs> oh, I, I think that's true that. on the bench. I think that's true on the bench. Yeah. I, I think that's true. I'm just saying, I don't think their first 15 is... Because the other thing, like, you also don't want to lose by 80 points. No. Right? All right. right so Next one. And this, this is this is an interesting one, Friday night as well. It's Austin versus Houston. Austin have something to play for. 
Houston do not. Even if Houston win and deny any <laughs> points, they can draw level with Austin, but they'll have one less win. Yeah. So then they cannot finish any better than Easy. third. Easy. Austin, one point behind LA, bonus point win gives them a shot potentially if LA stumble against Seattle. What are you doing here? If you're Houston first. Um, I rest players if I'm Houston. This game doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm playing next week. Yeah. That it's that they play a physical style, right? I don't care how fast Billy Britz runs, like he doesn't play in this game. Right? Yeah. Like be fresh. No, no. It doesn't risk. matter for Houston. No risks. Like you might see um the HTX team come out. This is where I would play the HTX team. Like I'll give players yeah. just like the opportunity i'd give some players that haven't played very much some time because i want to see them maybe i'd let some of the reserves compete for a place on the bench in the playoffs and then also i don't want to give anything away to austin like i'm going to play yeah. the most vanilla game like like you know we're gonna we're, you know we're gonna miss one and we're gonna run an x and that's it that's what we're gonna do right we're just gonna we're gonna come around the corner we're not gonna show anything um and you know we'll let our players go out and be physical we'll give opportunities but yeah, I think I think the Gilgronies will um, need to play that. They'll need to select their best side because they have something to play yeah. for, right? Um, because what they have, like the Gilgronies have, is they have um, a better point differential. So if LA win without a bonus point and the Gilgronies win with a bonus point, then yeah, they get to be number one seed, right? So yeah, you're right. The, you're right. Whatever. I tell you what I'm doing. If I'm Houston, very similar to what you said, I'm getting the biggest, most physical players in the HGX squad. Yeah. Nothing illegal. I'm like, listen, we do one phase, we kick, and then we bash them. <laughs> if they kick it back, we kick we it back. Kick and we bash. <laughs> you guys literally smash them. And, yeah, for and it'll be minutes. like, no, no, they'll smash them for 50 minutes, and then they'll be exhausted, and <laughs> like the Gilgronies will yeah. run out 30 points in the last 30 minutes, but. They'll be beaten up in the first fifty. That's actually yeah, that's yeah. that's some smart like devilish thinking there, bro. I don't, I don't yeah, want man. any like hockey goon activity like where you go there. We're gonna see like coat hangers in the opening minute. And it's like nah, none of, none of that. But uh, I, I would make it a real physical game. All right, uh, let's move on into the games that uh, again probably probably still mean a lot to the players. <coughs> said players playing for a, a contract, uh, pride, which is always a big thing as well. Utah taking on Dallas. This one at Dallas on Saturday at, give me a time here, 8 o'clock. Oh, i got to wait all the way, all day Saturday. I'm going to have a bunch of stuff to do around the house well, now. You're going to be you're gonna be a little, like, feeling a little bit overeaten, a little bit bloated after Friday night. You need some time to work that out. So with all of those yeah. games on Friday night. I know. Two of them at the same time. At least the late one is at nine, which which will give me some time there to, to recover. Uh, you, you, Utah will 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 get a Utah looked good. From I, mean, I mean, I thought yeah, they yeah. played they played the Giltinis really well. Um, they gave away a ton of penalties, right? But but we're still in the game. It's certainly been a little bit of an upturn at Utah. Obviously, a very disappointing season. Their coaching choice will be very very interesting to see how mm. they what 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 they do and um maybe they go back to chris latham now co- now covid's open maybe they go back there mm, no i don't think so but um i think the big <laughs> the big challenge for them is is uh, as i found out there were some visa challenges around the players they wanted to recruit right so i think what what that and again you you and i know that front office quite well um in terms of the ownership group and uh, i think plan b would be a little bit more thorough this year. And I think that's what they'll do. It's like, uh, maybe yeah, that's the fourth, get... the fourth thing, Dan, that I need is yeah. a really good visa lawyer. That's yeah, like the fourth yeah. thing a team needs to have. <laughs> You'd have to think that old Gloria would have that doll. Yeah, like someone's going to know you, someone there. It's like, I need a rubber stamp. I, I did, there, there, this is, I won't name names, but there was a situation where a foreign rugby player playing in New York and the, the club had a connection Dude got a green card, didn't marry anyone, had no connection. Boom, got a green card within like a month. And there was yep. like, just knew the right people and the strings were pulled and it was done. So uh, there we go. You just uh, got to wander around the streets of DC to try to find someone tied in with immigration. It wasn't me, Aaron. Aaron just wrote my <laughs> name. I got, I got married, had kids, paid $12,000 to an immigration lawyer. 
Uh, do you know that I'm going to digress here? Troy Hall, it's a Troy Hall story, scared me. He's saying, hey, we you know, had my interview and they asked all these questions and they're like grilling us. And so go use a lawyer just in case because you make one mistake, they kick you out of the country, you can never come back again. I was like, oh, my God, that's pretty heavy. So we literally walked in there, Jenna, my wife, and I, and we have Harrison, who was our baby at the time. La- lady took one look at us and looks at me and goes, yeah, listen, you're committed. Here you go, bang. Um, enjoy your stay. And that was that. So 13 grand, well spent. Could have got new golf clubs. What were we talking about? Utah. Yeah, Utah will win this game. All right, Old Glory also on Sunday, taking on Toronto, up in Toronto. This one, 12 o'clock. Uh, two games on Sunday, so just one game on the Saturday to get you through. Ooh, do you, I, I don't know here. Toronto, we're, we're in the mix coming late. There's a glimmer of hope. Is that kind of old glory? They've been out for a while. They're accustomed to disappointment at this stage. Uh, who do you like here? I'm going to take the home team. I think I think like it's the sort of thing where a little bit of extra motivation. I'm going to take Toronto. Oh, yeah. I think I think we're going to see in both teams. I mean, I think it's going to be. I think you're right. I think with Pete Smith, I think he's he's coming back, and so there's an opportunity to look at some other players. Right, this is really a developmental mm-hmm. chance. That's the difference between Toronto and Old Glory. Nate Osborne, another win, a really good performance. Maybe that gets him a contract. He's going to be a little bit more focused on the players that he has now. And Toronto, I think yeah. you'll see, will be a little bit more focused on the players for next year. That's a good call. Good shout. All right. Uh, last game of the week. And we will know pretty much everything at this stage when Seattle travel down to Los Angeles. LA will know exactly what they need to do, uh, whether they're a shot at locking up number one uh, or they've already got it locked up. We'll, we'll find out. Probably going to have to win this game, though. I'm guessing after the Houston chat. Who do you like here? So I think I like the Giltinis, although I think the Seawolves are going to bring like, – an intent and intensity they're going to be yeah. i think pretty mad that they didn't make it and they're going to show you that they're good but i think that, that um like if you look at the guiltinis and you look at their lineup i think their lineup is finally the lineup that that you would want them to have and, and i just look at the bench and i see taz smith ryan james and luke burton as their three backs and backs mm-hmm. has been a real problem for them but that's where like that's a really solid backline yeah and that's because they've got um so they have luke cardi back that means harrison goddard is back at nine um you know tom mitchell is now back at 15 so i think this is like a really good hanko is back this is a healthy la team and i think we're seeing that in their form and so i think la win this game but i don't think it's going to be easy um, and I think that's what they would want if they win and get a bonus point they want a physical game so can, they can have a week to recover um, and mm-hmm. they'll be ready to go. If Seattle don't turn up, which I, I think is really unlikely, and Seattle walk it by 50 points, I would be concerned about being undercooked going into the Western Conference final. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That's a, that's a good call. All right. I asked you uh, the questions you would have for coaching. Now, as we head into the last round, which Mad Monday would you want to go on if you could pick a team to go on Mad Monday with? Can you explain to me what Mad Monday is? I think I have an idea what it is. But Mad, maybe Mad Monday is the postseason celebrations that continue. Uh, well, for some teams, it'll be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. What? And then Monday. Uh, Monday is usually where you start to feel the, <clears throat> feel the pinch. Usually the championship would be played on a Saturday. And then come Monday, it was um, you dress up and clothes and stuff and have a great time, costumes. And, well, you know, I mean... I think we we heard a little bit of that story from Billy Meeks about the uh, um, not that yeah. he remembers much about the trip to Vegas, but I'm guessing that the Giltinis probably have a pretty good Mad Monday. Um, but you look and you're like, Austin's a pretty good place to have a Mad Monday. I mean, that's a pretty good. I party choose. Town. I choose Austin. Yeah. I just want to be the third wheel of Mark O'Keefe and Julian Dominguez. Just the third wheel. <laughs> Not the same size wheel. Do they need a third, third wheel? One. Do they need a third no, wheel? I feel like no, them no. together would be, no. those two would be a third wheel. A bike doesn't need a third wheel, but we have a tricycle. Uh, no one <laughs> needs it or uses it, but it exists. So I too would exist in that world of the, the third wheel. I'd have a great time. They maybe not too. I'd be like that. At, you know, you have like that one cousin in your extended family and you get to a family gathering and you're just like, oh, Joanne's here. Oh no! 
And you just so, do your so best to avoid them for six and, hours. And, and you were that cousin in your family? Like, like you would turn up and everyone would be like, oh, <laughs> dance if you here. ask everyone, If you ask everyone else, 100%. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Oh, well. Well, it should be a great weekend. You um, Any games or you, where are you watching from? What's the plan? Oh, I'm at home. Well, like the big news that we have is that Penelope scored her first try for the Superior Rugby Under 8s. That was last weekend. Um, I, I was not there to see it. It was, it was a long run, and there was another five-year-old blocking in, um, in front of her. Like, they're blocking, and we were just, like, not letting anyone get the flag. So, so we have another rugby game and a ballet performance on Saturday. So I'm really happy that nothing's happening Saturday during the day. Sunday, I will have to watch the game. So Friday, I'll have to watch the games during movie night on the sly until the kids go Fair to enough. sleep. So 9 o'clock game I'll be able to do, but the 7 o'clock games. I mean, I'm not sure how many screens I can have. Like, I'm going to have to have my iPad and my phone for the two Friday night games while watching Encanto or whatever that movie is that we're going to watch. Good, good. I won't spoil it for you. Good movie, though. It is a good movie. Oh, yeah. Um, like, how Sorry many times have we seen it? How many? No. Oh, like, okay. We're seeing I, I thought it this was the first one. No, no, no. no I, I think... I want to go see... I, I'm going to go see the new Top Gun while you're watching Encanto. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're a slightly different age of kid. It does. Well, looking forward to it. We'll be back next week. We preview all the finals. Finals footy. Ooh. It's getting closer and closer. We are uh, still no definitive word on where the championship will be. We'll know that after week two, the conference championships. But uh, we'll, we'll let everyone know when we find that out as well. Should be good. Anything else, Pete? Final thoughts? Musings? I don't, I, I, I don't think so, except are we going to get the winner of Super Brew on next week, Aaron, to, to, do, to pick games with us? I can figure that out. It's not scary, Larry. Suck it, scary Larry. It, I beat you this year. I, 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 did f- I picked five correct games last week and went down. That Seattle game. What? Yeah. yeah. I, went, <laughs> I, got the, I got the winning point for five games and still went down three spots. It was obnoxious. <laughs> I, I'm, in, I'm in nine still. I, I would have to have the most successful picks this year without getting the points picked. Like, I just never pick the margins right. Always pick the winner, never pick the margins. And it ruins rugby for me because I'm watching a game and I'll be like, okay, I got New York by 16. Well, they're up by 26. Well, New York has to stop playing well. Like, the, the other team has to score. And I start doing the math. Mate. If they score an unconverted try, kick a penalty, and then a drop goal, okay, they can do this. They can, oh, I'll win, but no luck. So, oh, I, I, I don't know how many people are doing this, but. Uh, BetMGM does have MLR, and uh, one of my friends texted me that he did a he he did a parlay on MLR last week, and I was just like, wow. I'm not listening, I'm not listening, I can't bet on anything, no rugby for me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he he said he lost the parlay by two points from the DC game or some something like that. I was like, oh. oh, there you go, a little bet in. Uh, I can't do it. It's not illegal. It's it's illegal in Kansas. Come on, Kansas. Get your stuff together. Let me let me bet. Colorado, you can do it. Legal in Colorado. I used to have a flutter every now and then. I don't think I'm allowed to bet either, am I, Aaron? If I'm a commentator, no. I think I, think I no, did the anti betting. Uh, you know, rugby. Keep rugby, rugby on so, side, yeah. I guess. You know. Whoops. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, I, I won't. Side. I won't. I won't bet either, guys. Don't worry about it. I promise you, I won't bet. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Oh, I don't want to go to prison. I'm too pretty. All right, that wraps it up. Another week in the books for the Professor Pete Steinberg, Aaron Castro, Ryan Ginty, our entire team here. This has been the MLR kickoff, and we will catch you next time.